Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Heritage U. Um, we're going to take some time and pray, and then we'll dive in tonight as we cover Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the time and prayer we've already got to have tonight. And Father, thank you for this opportunity to open your word. And Lord, just consider the, uh, the truth that we find, Lord. And just as Paul said to Timothy, Lord, we're just reminded that these, these scriptures that you gave us, Lord, lead us to salvation through Christ. And Father, as we think about Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and all the events that happened in them, Lord, I, I just pray that our eyes will truly be looking, uh, looking to the true restoration that we have in you. And Lord, I pray for each person today, Lord, that you'll just give us eyes to see and ears to hear wonderful things in your word. We love you, Lord, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, tonight we are going to be going, as I mentioned, over uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And so uh, a lot of material to cover, but just to kind of orient ourselves, remember over the last few weeks we've, we've done this rapid pace overview of the monarchical period in Israel's history. So the period of the kings, starting with King Saul, who was of course the first king of Israel, then leading to David and Solomon. Um, but after Solomon, you may remember that the kingdom split in half between north and south, and uh, Israel under Solomon and David, they enjoyed some uh, military independence. They were able to really support themselves and kind of fend off the, the bigger fish that were swimming in the ocean at the time, the other world empires. But after Solomon and after the breakup of the kingdom, uh, no longer did Israel get to determine its own destiny to any degree. They really had to relate to all of the other powers that were greater than them, and uh, ultimately they succumbed to those powers in the form of the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom in about 722 BC, and then the Babylonian kingdom came and uh, they conquered Israel really before that, but eventually Israel rebelled and they uh, broke through and uh, burned down the temple in 586 BC, destroyed Jerusalem, and led the people into the final stage of exile. And so here's, here's kind of where we're at. If, if you're like, okay, great, you know, I kind of get that, but it's kind of like, you know, you, you kind of throw something on the wall and you just hope something sticks. Th this is the stage of the Old Testament where there's a lot of history, there's a whole lot of empires rising and falling, there's a whole lot of, okay, people going to foreign kingdoms, some people kind of staying. It's a, it's a very kind of complicated and complex season in Israel's history. And, uh, and if you don't quite have that down, I just want to let you know you're not alone. In fact, I would say tonight, as we think about Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, I almost wish uh, Kevin could come back and teach the portion on Nehemiah because I'm, conv I, I'm sure he really knows it better than I do. Um, but this is a period where there's a whole lot of movement. There's a whole lot of motion. There's a whole lot, and think of it like this, there's a whole lot of political instability as well as a whole lot of spiritual instability. Because as we think about the nation of Israel, remember the nation of Israel was commissioned all the way back on Mount Sinai. God led the people of Israel out of Egypt. He called them to be a kingdom of priests. He called them to live set apart. And yet because they failed to do so, because they did not keep the law of Moses, God punished them and he did it in waves. He didn't do it all at once, but God punished them. And because of that, they were sent into exile. But here's the, here's the reality. Just because the people of Israel were punished for their disobedience to the law doesn't mean that God's purposes for Israel and through Israel are thwarted. So if you found yourself as a young man of probably about 15 named Daniel did, whenever the Babylonians came and took, them, took exiles to Babylon, the question for you if you were a young Daniel or a young Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego would be, Am I going to choose to remain faithful even though I find myself arriving on the scene at a very dark moment in Israel's history? Am I going to trust God? Am I going to follow the law even if I'm living in a foreign land? Am I going to stand up and say, no, my God is the true God. I serve him. I worship him alone. 
Will I do that? How will I respond? Now, we're not going to talk about the book of Daniel tonight. We're going to have to save that for later. But I just want to orient us to the time frame uh, that we're looking at tonight. And actually, as we get to Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, uh, Daniel was a contemporary of some of those. But we're going to talk a little bit about that history. And, and first, before we dive in, just to give us a sense of where we're at and what's going on, okay? So the book of Ezra takes place during uh, what's known as the Persian period. Now, if you're following along, in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, who is not Persian but Babylonian, he is the one who comes and destroys Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar is uh, the, the king of Babylon. He, he truly has a world empire. And if, if you're kind of just for context wanting to know about Nebuchadnezzar, he was the one who had the famous Gardens of Babylon. Like he was, he was a huge player on the world scene, not just for what he did biblically, but he was a very major ruler uh, in this time period and in world history. But eventually, and it was really after Nebuchadnezzar, uh, after Nebuchadnezzar passed away, the Persian kingdom began to rise in ascendancy, okay? So the Babylonians, they conquered Jerusalem, but in about 50 years or so, Babylon would no longer be the biggest, the biggest bully on the block. The Persians under Cyrus the Great rose in power so that actually Cyrus, he conquered uh, Babylon without even a battle. He basically marched into, into Babel, took over, everyone knew they were going to lose, so the Babylonians just basically said, nope, we're not even going to fight. And Cyrus the Great, uh, he began to rule almost 50 years later in 539 BC. Now, Cyrus is actually mentioned in the Bible. In fact, it's very fascinating. Cyrus uh, is mentioned as a messiah, in the Bible, my anointed one Cyrus, um, not the Messiah, but someone that God used as a ruler in history in order to accomplish his purposes to punish the Babylonians for their sin against taking over Israel. But not just for those purposes, because Cyrus and under Cyrus, there was going to be a change in policy because the Persians in general had a much more tolerant or lenient policy than say Babylon or Assyria. And here's what I mean by that. Cyrus, his attitude was this, I may have conquered you, but he had kind of an appeasement policy, not with the nations themselves, but with the gods of the nations. So Cyrus, he issued this famous edict where he basically said, okay, all of these nations that I've conquered, because he didn't just conquer Israel or Babylon, he ruled over really that entire area of the world. He said, okay, I'm going to allow the people to go back to their homeland I'm going to allow them to rebuild their temples and worship their gods. And so Cyrus had a much more open-minded policy, although the Persians were generally skeptical of any religious group that claimed to have an exclusive claim to the truth. Now, if some of this sounds familiar, it really should, because history repeats itself and is very similar in a lot of ways to some things that we face today. But in any case, Cyrus, uh, Cyrus and other Persians, this is going to become important in the book of Esther particularly, they looked at sus with suspicion on the Jewish people who claimed to have one God and one God alone. And I, I want to pause and I want to kind of press in on this for a moment, because for us, monotheism or belief that there's one God or an exclusive claim to truth, that's pretty normal for us. But I, I want to press in on this because it's true all the way through New Testament times. Most religions did not claim to be exclusively true in the ancient Near Eastern world. And here's what I mean by that. Most religions were national religions. So the Persians, they worshiped the gods of Persia. The Babylonians worshiped the gods of Babylon. The Greeks worshiped the Greek gods. The Romans worshiped the Romans gods. And basically all of the other nations said, yeah, there are many, many different gods. And when we fight each other, it's really not us fighting each other. It's actually our gods fighting each other. So the gods of Egypt beat up on the gods of Babylon for a while, and then the gods of Babylon beat up on the gods of Assyria for a while, and the Assyrians beat up on the Persians. That it was, it was, they, they believed that all of those things were true, or at least they believed it enough to say, like, and, and think about this, like uh, on the Areopagus, whenever Paul goes to Athens in Acts 17, worship all the gods you want to. In fact, make sure you don't miss a god. That's what Cyrus did. He said, I want you to go, I want you to go rebuild your temples. I want you to go worship your gods. Oh, and by the way, say a prayer for me. The more the better. The Jewish people, 
from their very, from their very beginning were different because they said our God is the only God. And our God doesn't let us worship any other God. Why? Because they are no gods at all, but because he's also a jealous God and he wants our heart. Now, here's the thing. Israel was a tiny little fish in the sea, at which point all of the other nations said, they basically laughed at the Israelites. What do you mean your God's the only God? Like, it, it was a laughable thing. I've, I've said this before. The, the other nations they referred to, and especially the Greeks in Jesus' time, they referred to the Israelites or the Jewish people as atheists because they did not believe in the gods, plural. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind because to, to be a group of people who would claim our God and God alone is the true God could get you into trouble. Persian period is where we're jumping into. Cyrus took over Babylon and the Persians are gonna rule for a couple of hundred years. Now, before we dive into Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, I wanna let you know there is a debated chronology about these books. There are some things about them that are a little bit confusing and there are a number of reasons for that. We're gonna talk about them and hopefully it'll help clarify. I know it was helpful for me even as I was studying this. So, uh, the, the, the big problem in terms of crafting the chronology is not what the Bible says, but it's the names of the kings that are used. There's actually quite a bit of historical evidence about the kings of Persia. We know their timeline. We know when they rose, when they fell. There's a whole lot of history there. But the Bible does not always use the same names as those names that are used, uh, say, in the Persian annals. And, and here's, you might say, well, well, why? There's many reasons for that. One of the reasons is kings would often have uh, regnal names. They would also have personal names and they would have names given to them by the Jews, right? So uh, for instance, and, and this is familiar to us, this isn't unusual in history. When a king becomes, say, a king in England, they have to choose a regnal name, which may or may not be the name that they were born with. Um, or whenever, uh, say, you know, there was a king of Scotland who becomes the king of Scotland and the king of England, he might choose a different name as he becomes the king of England. Um, very common. So in addition to this, having a regnal name versus a personal name, also the Israelites would sometimes give names to the kings. And so it's, it's not always clear exactly how the name given to someone in scripture lines up with the name that, that history records, all right? Another issue in terms of the chronology is this, that oftentimes the Bible will uh, skip major sections of time without indicating to the reader that's what they're doing. And here's why they could do that, because the first readers would have naturally understood. So let me give you an example. Let's say that I was talking to you and I was saying, you know, hey, let's talk about George Washington. You know, George Washington was the father of the country and we start talking about the history. And then in the next sentence I say, you know, and Abe Lincoln, he was a different kind of president than George Washington. Well, guess what? We would have skipped, you know, four score and seven years ago, right? Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. We would have skipped a whole lot of time, but you could understand what I was saying. Why? Because it would have been so immediately knowable to you that you could skip from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War without anybody saying, oh, well, what happened? I mean, it, it, the point being what happened in between isn't really super important to what I would be saying to you in that moment. Well, the same thing happens in the book of Ezra where there's a gap of approximately like 58 years between the first several chapters and the last several chapters. It's very similar to if someone were saying, well, let's talk about the history of the United States. And you say, well, George Washington and then Abe Lincoln. It's not that the stuff in between doesn't matter. It's just that it didn't matter for the purposes of this particular account, okay? But that can create some confusion. So if you're ever reading something and someone says, well, hey, you know, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah weren't contemporaries or whatever, there, there's all kinds of debates and, and different things. I'm gonna present to you a timeline that I think is best and is pretty commonly accepted, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Again, Ezra and Nehemiah, we divide these in our Bibles as two different books. Um, but biblically and in the Hebrew canon, they were considered to be one book, which is why uh, when you read through them, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of continuity. There's a lot of similarity in language. But uh, when it comes to Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah contain first person accounts from Ezra and from Nehemiah. 
So obviously we have a high degree of confidence. And when I say first person accounts, in Ezra you will read, I, Ezra, did this, said this. In Nehemiah you'll read, ne- you know, I was the governor and I did this or I prayed this. It's first person accounts. It's essentially like their journal or what they kept from, uh, the hist- from recording the history themselves. Uh, there are also events that took place well before Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, as well as events that aren't first person from Ezra and Nehemiah. So a lot of scholars think that basically there was someone later, an editor or compiler who came back, and perhaps it was Nehemiah or Ezra, we don't know. Um, But someone eventually said, I'm gonna take Ezra's accounts, I'm gonna take Nehemiah's accounts, I'm gonna take these other accounts that may have been written by Ezra and Nehemiah, maybe they were royal annals or records, but whatever they were, someone came along and eventually put them in one volume and essentially said, this is the account of the rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel all the way to the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem under Nehemiah. And we're going to talk about those people. If you're not familiar with them, that's totally fine. But it's possible that the final version was written by an editor. Now, we're going to go over uh, the timeline, okay? Um, So again, it's like anything else. The history of the exile is, is not clean. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Um, l- let me give you an example from American history. So uh, when, when did the Revolutionary War start? Well, we know when the Declaration of Independence was drafted, right, or signed, July 4th, 1776. But the war started before that right? You've got the battles of Lexington and Concord that were before that. You've got the Boston Massacre that's before that. Before that, you have like the Boston Tea Party. Um, So there's all kinds of like steps that lead up to war. And honestly, if, if you just stopped and said, well, when did the war start? Well, no one just sat down one day and said, well, we're at war. It was a slow escalation. Similarly, when it came to Babylon defeating Israel, it really came in waves, So prior to 600 BC, Babylon comes in and basically says, hey, we're we're more powerful than you. We beat you in battle. We're going to take some exiles to prove it. That was the first wave of exiles. Well, then Nebuchadnezzar eventually comes back. Jerusalem says, no, we're not really going to serve you. Okay, well, we're going to come punch you again, take a second wave of exiles. And then finally in 586 BC, that's when Babylon said, okay, enough's enough. Now we're going to come destroy Jerusalem, kill everybody, burn the temple down. So here's my point. It came in waves, even as Babylon took over Israel. And if, if, if you're glazing over, here's, here's why I say this. When it comes to the prophecies, when it comes to the, this period of history, there were many, many chances for Israel to repent, but they chose not to. And meanwhile, and this is, this is an extremely busy period in Israel's history because you've got prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel who are going out there saying, repent, repent, turn, turn, and no one did it. You've got, the, you've got Daniel who's alive at this time, okay, as a young man at the beginning of this. You've got Ezra and Nehemiah who eventually kind of arise during the exile. But this is, this is a complicated season of history. Um, but as we think about it, this timeline is going to simplify Simplify it and give us some handles. So, captivity, okay, 70 years in captivity. This was prophesied by Jeremiah. Israel's got to pay for their crimes. Uh, You've got this idea of the land having its Sabbath rest for this period of time. Um, The temple is rebuilt under Zerubbabel. This is going to be the first like six or so chapters of Ezra. Zerubbabel was, uh, well, we'll talk about him in a minute, but Zerubbabel begins the process of rebuilding the temple. Uh, They got off to a great start, stalled for a little while, and then came back to rebuild it. So uh, at that point, you've got Haggai and Zechariah. They write these uh, prophecies and basically say, listen, we need to to get serious about rebuilding the temple. There's a gap, this is what I mentioned, a gap of approximately 57 years, but the book of Esther takes place in between this rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel and the reform under Ezra, okay? Between Ezra and Nehemiah, approximately 12 years, Ezra leads a religious reform. Nehemiah primarily leads a political reform. Now, those can't really be separated. We're going to talk about that as we go through. And again, if all of this is just like you know, I've never even heard of Ezra, Nehemiah, or Zerubbabel. We're going to talk about this and try to explain it, but this is just an overview. So captivity, temple, 
Esther, reform, wall rebuilt, and then eventually uh, you've got um, the, the period that's between the Old Testament and the New, once the period of the exile uh, more or less comes to an end, okay? So that's, that, that's what Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther cover. Huge period of history. But the similarity in the theme that we're gonna kind of draw out of all of this is how do God's people live faithfully in times and circumstances that are hostile to their faith? How do God's people live whenever there is no Solomon on the throne? Whenever there is no David who wants to slay Goliath, whenever the law is not held in high regard and people not just do what's right in their own eyes, but they've done what's right in their eyes for so long that now they're cast into exile, the future is totally uncertain, there is no temple to speak of, well, what does that mean for sacrifice? What does that mean for prayer? What does that mean for how you worship God? This was a, a crucial time and it was a forging time in terms of the religion of Judaism and in terms of the identity of Israel. So that's all to set the stage. So let's, let's kind of dive in and let's talk about what these books contain. So, and, and unfortunately, we're going to have to do a really quick overview of it as usual. Um, the first six chapters of Ezra, and if we have time, I'm going to go back and try to, to, try to look at some of these specific passages. But the first six chapters of Ezra really describe the, the uh, rebuilding of the temple under a man by the name of Zerubbabel, okay? Now, Zerubbabel was a son of David. So he's in the Davidic line, and he's eventually chosen to be the royal governor over the kingdom of Judah. Now, again, don't think kingdom of Judah in terms of like Solomon or, or like major player. No, at this point, it's been decimated. It's a very weak, uh, you know, Jerusalem is essentially like a, a large village in one sense. I mean, it's, it's more than that, but it's, it's very decimated. Don't think like glorious Jerusalem. Think like, th think about this. The reason Cyrus told people they could go back and rebuild is why? Because he didn't think it would be a threat. Sure, go back and rebuild. Knock yourself out. I'm the king. Everybody knows it. You're not a threat. Go back and rebuild. Well, Zerubbabel does, and he takes back a group with him who are faithful, and here's what they do. They say, okay, God punished us. The temple was destroyed, but think about this. The temple is essential in following the law, right? Because if I sin and I have to go offer a sacrifice, I have to have a place where I go offer it. The temple is supposed to be the very presence of God. It's supposed to be the most holy place in all of earth. So Zerubbabel and all of the people with him, they go back to Jerusalem and say, we've got to rebuild this temple so we can essentially restart our faith. Not that their faith was broken, but we can restart following the law in the way that God demands. So they go back to Jerusalem and they rebuild the foundation of the temple. Now, on the one hand, you got to give them credit. Great job, you built the foundation. But here's essentially what happened. They built the foundation, but when they did, it said this, that there were some older people who were there who remembered, because they were old enough to remember pre-exile, they remembered the glory of Solomon's temple before it was torn down, and they saw this foundation of the new temple and while some people who hadn't seen the old one, they were all celebrating, yay, 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 we've got the foundation of a new temple. All the people who had seen the old one, they were crying at the same time because they said there is absolutely no way this new temple could ever be anything like it was in Solomon's day. So you got to give them credit for trying, but then eventually they realized, well, you know, this temple, even if we build it, it's not going to be like it was back in the day. And so really, they kind of ran out of steam. They started by building the foundation. They ran out of steam. But after approximately 16 years, you have Haggai and Zechariah, who if you read those prophecies, they basically come back and say, hey, wait a minute. You're trying to build your own houses and you're trying to advance your own lives, but you've neglected and you've forgotten about the house of God. And so Haggai and Zechariah encouraged them, go back, finish what you started, and rebuild the temple of God. It might not seem like much, but God is with you. God will bless you. Rebuild the temple. And they do, and because of that, they're blessed. 
okay? So that takes us basically through the first uh, six chapters of Ezra, at which point it totally shifts. And this is where it gets kind of confusing because there's a period of silence. If, you, if we go back just for a second to this, there's a period of silence for 57 years. And this is, uh, this is kind of like the lost history of Israel. We don't really know what happened to Zerubbabel. We don't know what happened during this 57 years. There's a whole lot of lost time in terms of in Israel. Now, as we're going to see, the story of Esther takes place kind of in between Ezra 6 and 7. But in terms of the history of Israel and what went on in Jerusalem, there's not a whole lot there for the in-between. Now, Ezra comes on the scene, and here's what you need to know about Ezra. Ezra is a scribe, and really to to say that he is a scribe is to uh, kind of minimize his significance. Ezra was, was kind of like the scribe. He, he was like the scribe of all scribes. He was someone who was of the line of Aaron, so he was a priest. But he's also someone who is, who is very, very closely associated with the law of Moses. Why? Because when Ezra comes on the scene, he's, he basically leads a religious reform where he, te- where he tells the people of Israel, you need to come back to the law. So he he basically reintroduces the law of Moses into the life of Judaism, which ultimately leads uh, to a pretty incredible revival. So Ezra uh, reads the law to the people. He makes sure they understand it. He makes sure that they can apply it. And and he becomes, in, in one sense, he becomes like the first model of a modern preacher, and, and here's what I mean by that. And, and I want you to think about this. We're going to talk about it a little more before we end. When the Israelites went into exile, they had to really reimagine their faith. And they had to reimagine it because, remember, the temple's gone, at which point the scriptures and corporate worship became much more important. So, uh, so a word that we're familiar with is synagogue, right? Uh, Jesus, in Jesus' day, there were many different synagogues. Well, the synagogue began during the exilic period or the period of the exile. Why? Because there was no temple. So what did the Jewish people do? They started meeting in homes or they started to, to, to build a, a corollary to what we would call modern day congregations where they would worship together, where they would read the word of God together. And at least part of this goes back to Ezra, who was uh, one of the major scribes of the day. So uh, under God's protection, and this is a theme as well, we're going to see this in Ezra, we're going to see it in Nehemiah, we're going to see it in Daniel, we're going to see it uh, basically in the entire exilic period. They desperately sought God's protection. Why? Because they had no political power really themselves. They were totally dependent upon other people. But under God's protection, Ezra leads a group of exiles back to Jerusalem in 458 BC. And, uh, and his, his big thing was, we cannot be a syncretistic people. Here's what I mean by that. Syncretism basically means you take something from one religion, you take it from another, let's live and let live. We're all gonna do our own thing, but we're gonna kind of mix and match and live syncretistically. Well, Ezra, and, and, and don't forget this, this was the policy of basically every nation that conquered. What they did was, we conquer you, we bring in other people, you intermingle, you mix and marry. This is what happened in Samaria up north, but it happened basically everywhere. We intermarry, why? To weaken you and to assimilate you, okay? This this really does give some context when Paul says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, right? It's a very similar idea. God, remember, says to the Israelites, don't intermarry with foreign women. Why? Because like Solomon, your heart will be led astray. Well, what happened? When Ezra came back to Jerusalem, there were all kinds of men who had married foreign women. And listen, like we've talked about with the book of Ruth, it wasn't just that they married someone who was foreign, okay? It's, it's not like God had some type of ethnic hatred for non-Jews. It's the fact that by marrying the foreign women, their hearts were being led astray to try to assimilate the beliefs of the Bible or the beliefs of the Torah with the beliefs of the women that they married. So it became a very syncretistic approach. Ezra comes back and he basically says, this cannot happen. In fact, it was so bad that Ezra under his leadership, he basically repented on behalf of Israel and also said to the people, you've got to get rid of your foreign wives and families. 
and they do under Ezra's leadership. That's the end of the book. It, it's, it really feels very tragic as you read it, but it speaks to the links where, where Ezra says, listen, if we're truly gonna follow the law of God, if we're truly gonna love God only with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we've got to leave aside all of the entanglements that we have voluntarily made by marrying foreign women and having them in our midst. So Ezra leads the people to send away their foreign wives and he leads them to a spiritual renewal where the law becomes sinner in the life of Judaism, okay? Um, next, we're going to talk about Nehemiah. And truly, um, th th this is going to be like a tiny brief overview of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah, um, he essentially is the, the governmental counterpart to Ezra. So Ezra and Nehemiah are contemporaries. Nehemiah comes back a little bit after Ezra. But Ezra really concentrates on spiritual reform. Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem. And again, God gives him favor. Uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king. By the way, cupbearer doesn't mean like royal butler. It basically meant that he was someone who was in very high standing with the king. He was uh, privy to all the information that the king had. Why? Because the cupbearer is what? Right by the king. Uh, and he was also very politically astute. So he hears, Nehemiah does, about the walls in Jerusalem and how Jerusalem is really in complete shambles, at which point he's broken about it. He goes before the king and uh, the king says, Nehemiah, why are you so brokenhearted? Eventually the king gives him permission to go back and rebuild the walls, which is amazing, right? Nehemiah believes that God has given them favor, that the king is literally going to bankroll the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem. Now, some might say, again, that's not really good political policy. Why would a king pay for the rebuilding of walls of a famous citadel like Jerusalem? Well, apparently, again, it's because he didn't really feel like it was that much of a threat. So don't, don't think of it as a total rebuilding of the kingdom of Israel. Think of it as this king basically said, you know what, Nehemiah, I like you. Go do it. I'm not threatened. Rebuild the walls. Now, here's the deal. Nehemiah goes and he does this, but as they do they experience opposition. So you may remember this famous story in Nehemiah where uh, half of the people have swords while the other half essentially have hammers, right? Half of the men are there with swords to protect all of the workers while the other half of the people, they work. Meanwhile, the kind of rulers who don't really like Nehemiah but have to respect him because after all, he knows the king, right? They basically are like, oh, this silly, this, this silly wall. You know, if a fox runs over it, the whole thing's gonna fall down, at which point the Israelites are like, well, whatever, we're gonna keep going. And eventually, those same people are like, no, we can't let this happen, but God is on their side. And as Kevin just talked about uh, prior to this in the prayer time, uh, after a very short period of time, they had the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. And uh, the book of Nehemiah contains a lot of leadership principles. Um, but another thing that, that we need to talk about with Nehemiah is he didn't just help rebuild the wall. He also had to, to reestablish some principles that were true in, in the Torah, but were not being applied. And by this, I mean um, some of the Jewish people who were very wealthy, they were actually exploiting some of the, the poorer Jewish people who lived there at the time. So there were Jewish people in Jerusalem who were so poor, they had to sell their kids into slavery just to pay their bills. There were others that basically kind of mortgaged their property or, or essentially lost everything that they had because, because the people who had all of the money said, hey, well, you know, work for us. Well, okay, but you don't have enough money. I mean, very similar to like Joseph in Egypt. Oh, you need food and you have no money. Well, give us your land, give us your houses. At which point Nehemiah had to come in and say to the rich Jews, why are you exploiting your own brother? others. That's not how it was designed to be. So Nehemiah comes and he confronts the, the economic injustice, but essentially here's how the book of Nehemiah ends. After the wall is complete, Nehemiah and Ezra come together. They lead the community in a public renewal ceremony where they repent of their sins. This is what Kevin was talking about. They repent of their sins and there are some amazing prayers in Ezra and Nehemiah. There's public repentance for sins they basically say, God, forgive us for all of the past sins of our fathers. Forgive us for our broken, brokenness and our sin. And God, help us to faithfully live as your people in the promised land. And they commit to do this um, under the leadership of Nehemiah and Ezra. 
Now, whether or not they continue that way is another question. But at least from this period on, you do have a remnant in the promised land. And, and again, if, um, if we're talking basically like the end of the 400s BC, that's 400 years before Christ, Really, for the next 400 years, you have a Jewish people who, though imperfect, are serious, at least in some ways, externally, about following the law. Like, it does play a major part in their identity and how they see themselves all the way up to the time of the Pharisees, right? All the way for 400 years to the time of Jesus. So we're creeping closer to biblical times. And as we do, again, the idea of following the law and worshiping God, even if it's in a synagogue, it becomes much more common when it comes to the people of Israel. Okay? Um, Let's talk about Esther. Um, So Esther is a very interesting book. If you think of Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah are highly historical, okay? And, and what do you mean? How can something be highly historical? Well, literally, some of it was first-person accounts of their writing that, that's included in Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra is not unhistorical at all, but it's written in a narrative form that is not true of Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? Ezra and Nehemiah, a lot of first-person accounts Esther is essentially written in narrative form, all right, which means that it has a lot more craftsmanship with it. Uh, a lot of people describe Ezra as a, as a kind of romance book. I think that's a, a, a stretch of the imagination. I'm not really sure there was a whole lot of romance involved at all, uh, but in any case, uh, it is a book that is highly crafted. There's a, a clear plot line when it comes to, to Esther, and, uh, but before we talk about kind of that plot, I want to talk about some, uh, some kind of uh, just background information we need to know. So the book of Esther never explicitly mission, mentions God by name, very unusual. It never mentions the covenants. It never mentions David or the Davidic line. All of those things are absent, okay? Which is why some people consider Esther to be a very secular book. Now, here's what I think is a better way to understand that. There's a whole lot of things in Esther that just happen to happen, right? Esther happens to be chosen. The Jews happen to be under threat when Esther happens to be able to go to the king. And and you see what I'm saying. God's invisible hand is moving all throughout the book of Esther. But it's interesting because uh, since Esther does not include the name of God, there were some rabbis who really considered it like not worthy to be considered scripture. Um, It wasn't, for instance, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were no manuscripts found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the only Old Testament book where no scrolls were found. Um, Not that that means that somehow it wasn't important, but it's possible that the people who had the Dead Sea Scrolls didn't consider it to be canonical. Um, Like I said, the events of Esther take place in the Persian period between Zerubbabel coming and building the temple and uh, Ezra coming and leading reform. So it's that time period. It takes place in Susa, the capital of Persia at the time. It's also written in a highly crafted narrative form. Now, um, we obviously can't go through the entire book. It really is, um, it's incredible because the plot line, uh, it's kind of like reality is, is stranger than fiction. Well, that's, that's kind of the book of Esther in a nutshell. The king basically has a giant party. Uh, he gets totally, totally wasted with all of his friends. Remember, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Not everything that the Bible describes, it, it doesn't condone everything it describes. But the king gets totally wasted. He says to his wife, Vashti, Vashti, come out and basically show off how hot you are to all of my friends. At which point she says, no, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, and he basically goes bananas and, and nuts because he says, oh no, my wife told me no. At which point all of the men who are with him says, king, you can't let your wife tell you no because once everybody hears that she tells you no, they're going to tell us no. So you need to tell her you're getting a new wife. Vashti is still part of the harem, but no longer his main wife, at which point he says, okay, send me all of the eligible virgins of the land, find the one that's most beautiful, and I will marry her, and by golly, that's going to teach Vashti her lesson, okay? I mean, that's a total paraphrase. You can read it, but the, um, they pick Esther, okay? Esther hides most likely her Jewish identity. Why? Because again, the Persians don't really like Esther. 
the Jewish people having one God and one God only. It'd probably be really bad if the wife of the king only served a God that the king didn't serve or worship, or at least didn't serve or worship exclusively. So she hides the fact that she's a Jew. Meanwhile, you've got her cousin Mordecai, who's a royal official. And again, it's amazing, isn't it, how all of these Jewish people can maintain their loyalty to God, but also seem to be able to show a loyalty to the king. Mordecai, through the book, is actually going to discover a plot to kill the king. He's going to uncover it once Esther's queen. She tells the king the king is saved, and that's going to be a major plot line. But meanwhile, you've got this evil man named Haman, right? Haman hates the Jews. He particularly hates Mordecai because Mordecai refuses to bow down to him when he passes by, ticks him off, and because of that, he says, I'm going to kill all of the Jews. So this is where the the crisis point becomes a a boiling point. Haman says, I'm going to get the king to pass a law that says everyone can kill the Jews. Remember, people are skeptical of Jews. Jews are not even really telling people they're Jews necessarily if they can help it, like Esther. But the, the law gets passed and Esther reaches this moment as a queen who is favored by the king. Will she stand up for her people or will she hide behind her own protection? She's not likely to be killed by anybody. But will she protect herself or will she stand up and do what's right? At which point Mordecai says the famous line, who knows, perhaps it was for such a time as this that God has put you in this place. But he warns her and he says, even if God doesn't use you, God's going to save us somehow, but hopefully he uses you. Okay, the plot continues, and again, this is a paraphrase, but the plot continues. Um, Esther does decide that, uh, that she is going to stand up. She asked the people, and this is so fascinating, she asked the people to fast. It doesn't say she asked them to pray, although I really believe it's implied. She says, I want you to fast for three days. All of my gals, we're going to fast for three days too. They do. She invites the king to dinner along with Haman. All right. The king goes home, can't sleep that night, has the people read the royal annals to him, at which point, lo and behold, he again happens to read the account of how Mordecai saved him. And this is where the story just gets so hilarious, right? Because the king, uh, the king says, uh, he calls in Haman. Remember, Haman hates Mordecai, passed a law to kill Mordecai just because he hates him so much. And he says to Haman, Haman, what should I do to the person the king favors? Which point, of course, Haman thinks he's talking about me. Well, what should he do? A royal prince should drag him around with the king's horse and put on the king's robe and he should do all of this honor. At which point the king says, bam, I love it, Haman, good job. Why don't you go and lead this procession for Mordecai because he was the one who saved me from death. At which point Haman is so mad, he has a gallows built for Mordecai to kill him. Uh, But eventually Esther goes, the king is eating with Esther, also eating with Mordecai, or I'm sorry, with Haman at the same time, and uh, she reveals this. It's like the ultimate gotcha moment because she says to the king, uh, basically, someone's trying to kill me and all my family, and the king says, who would dare kill you and all your family? And she points and says, that guy right there, Haman would do it. The king is so mad, he leaves, he comes back, Haman is literally laying on his wife's bed, talk about a no-no, and then the king says, Haman, are you serious? At which point, Haman basically said, or the king says, Haman, you tried to kill Esther, you tried to kill Mordecai, you're going to go hang on the gallows that Mordecai was going to hang on. Uh, Haman is killed along, along with everyone who's with him, his family. Um, Mordecai is basically given a promotion all the way up to where Haman was. But the, the thrust of the story is that God saved all of the Jewish people through Esther and through her willingness to step forward and be used by God. So um, the, the bottom line is God providentially places Esther where he wants her. He gives her this opportunity um, and he protects his people and brings blessings to those who obey him and who are faithful. Um, So uh, one familiar theme of the exile that we're going to see is there's a refusal to bow down even to foreign leaders who at least on the surface would demand your allegiance. Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman, okay? Let's, Let's talk quickly about the theology that we see here. Once again, and this is so important, the Bible does not condone everything that it describes, 
It's a very important principle. A lot of times we read things in Scripture and we think, well, that's crazy. How could that be in the Bible? Well, the Bible doesn't pull its punches. It describes the reality of, uh, you know, a king who says, I can't be publicly humiliated by my wife, so I'm going to put her aside. I'm going to take the best virgin for myself, and I'm going to have her for me. That's just the reality of a fallen world. Uh, and again, it's why, why do we think this is a romantic book? Um, it really has nothing to do with romance in that sense, okay? Um, next, God's desire for his people, whether it's Zerubbabel, Esther, Ezra, or Nehemiah, his desire for his people is to stay faithful even when they find themselves living in, in, in pagan lands. So there's this famous passage in Jeremiah 29. It's not Jeremiah 29, 11, but it's in that same text where Jeremiah says to the people, hey, you're in exile, plant sow seed, marry, build houses. And here's what he says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. The attitude of the Jewish people was, hey, God has put us here. We hate that. But if we're here, we're going to live and be salt and light. We're going to live and we're not going to eat the king's meat. We're going to live and be faithful, and when God gives us the chance, we'll come back to Jerusalem, we'll rebuild, and we'll get a new start. But God wants them to be faithful in the midst of pagan cultures. Also, God is sovereign. This is so, so important. It doesn't matter whether it's Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Darius, Belshazzar, whoever's on the throne, it, it, not that God doesn't care. I was about to say God doesn't care. It's that God can use any of them. And listen, these guys were not good guys. Nebuchadnezzar kind of has a revival. Okay, I'll grant him that. But these other guys, they are not good. Like These are not nice people. They are world-conquering autocratic dictators who get everything they want and then celebrate. They are pagans. But God uses them for his purposes to lead history in the direction that he wants to. Next, God will raise up leaders to preserve and protect his people. We see it with Ezra. We see it with Nehemiah. We see it with Daniel. All throughout, very dark period, but there are leaders that God raises up. We see it with Esther. God uses men and women of faith to bring about his desired ends. Next, we see this in Ezra and Nehemiah particularly. Prayer, confession, and obedience are essential to renewal. You know, I read, I read someone who said it like this. Every, I think it was in our textbook, every time you see renewal in the Old Testament, you also see a renewed emphasis on Scripture as well as prayer and repentance. It's because that's absolutely how God desires it to be. Other considerations, we've already talked about this, so I'm just going to glance over it. The exile was fundamental in the formation of Judaism as we know it. You have a greater emphasis on the text of Scripture why? Because especially in a time where there's no temple, or if there is a temple, you can't go to it because you live in Babylon or you live in, you know, Persia or wherever. This text of Scripture becomes that much more important, as does your fellowship with your other Jewish people. I mean, think about this. You live in a city, say, of a, you know, let's say you lived in uh, Tarsus, for instance. Who knows how many people are in Tarsus? I'm going to make this up. But there's 100,000 people in Tarsus. There's 500 Jews. Well, guess what? If you're one of those Jews, you're going to take it seriously that you're a Jew, you're going to get to know all the other Jews, and you're going to live in a community of Jews so that you can live faithfully in a, in a community that doesn't value or care about what you believe. This became the crucible upon which Judaism was forged, the exile did. Um, also, from the exile on, and this is important, from the exile on, God's people lived in what's known as the dispersion or the diaspora or the diaspora. And the idea here is that no longer would Jerusalem be the only place where, or not just Jerusalem, but the, the, the country of Israel or the land of Canaan, Judaism would no longer just be centralized there. It would be dispersed really all throughout the ancient world. So it's kind of crazy. And, um, and really, even in the book of Acts, it says this, Moses had been proclaimed in all of the cities all across the world from ancient times is what Paul says. And his point is, there were Jewish people who went to Assyria, who went to Persia, who eventually made it over to Greece. And all the time they said, we're gonna still be Jewish. We're gonna maintain our faith. But eventually, where was Paul from? There's a reason I talked about Tarsus. He was from Tarsus, which was where? Not in the promised land, right? 
well far away from Jerusalem or the temple, which again speaks to the point of the scriptures being so important for the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people. Now, the people of Israel, last thing I'll say, they looked forward to a time when the glory of Israel would be restored. So it was kind of like this. Zerubbabel, good job, but the people were weeping because the temple wasn't anything like it. Ezra and Nehemiah, hey, we've got some walls, but was it anything like it was under Solomon? No. Or even under David? No. So the people of Israel were looking forward to a time when in the messianic kingdom, the glory of Israel would not just be renewed, but would be multiplied. They knew it hadn't happened, but they were looking forward to it. And many of them were looking forward while living faithfully and obediently, all right? Takeaways, we're gonna fly through these. Our call is to live faithfully in the time and place where we have been called to live. We don't get to choose the time or the place where we live, just like Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah didn't get to choose living in an exile, but they had to do the best with what they were given. God calls people into various roles. Some people are Ezra's, some people are Nehemiah's, some people are Zerubbabel, some people are Esther's. And we need them all. This is, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12. We're all part of the body of Christ. God wants our total devotion from him. And he will purge away anything that draws us away from him. This speaks to what Ezra did. Marrying these, the, the foreign women and having these entanglements with other gods, God says, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt big time. But you've got to give your full heart to me. God wants our total devotion. Next, God will provide for all of our needs as we pursue his plan. Guess what? God provided for Zerubbabel. God provided for Esther. God provided for Ezra. God provided for Nehemiah. Protection, payroll, all the rest. God gave them everything they needed. And even though Israel didn't have power or influence or status, God divinely orchestrates that they will have all that they need. And so we come back to it. The basis of all of this is faith and trust in God that he'll provide. And so as we think about this period, it's a very important, fascinating period of Israel's history. It leads us all the way up. We're going to eventually go back in time to talk about the Psalms and Proverbs and other things that were kind of more Solomon era. But this is the period of history leading us all the way up to the silent period between the Testaments and then eventually the coming of the Messiah. But we've got some time for questions. So uh, let's, let's stop right there. And uh, any, any questions as we think about these, these books? Yeah. Yeah. So um, whenever, whenever the sins of Israel, for instance, are exposed with Ezra and Nehemiah, both of them pray these amazing prayers. I mean, and, and it's not just, okay, they prayed amazing prayers. It's really indicative that, hey, we are reestablishing prayer. Again, that, that personal aspect of a relationship with God is so important because Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they don't say, well, let's just go through the motions of, of and I didn't mention this, um, they got the Levitical priesthood back up and going, so there were sacrifices, other things, but they learned through the exile that personal relationship with God was truly essential because for 70 years, they had no sacrificial system, right? They had no temple they could go to. At which point, again, the, the idea of prayer and confession or a personal relationship or identity with God became more important to them than it ever had. And so every time we see, uh, every time we see God move in a powerful way in these books, we also see prayer and confession. Um, and that was a huge part of what they did, confessing their sins and truly repenting. Other thoughts or questions, insights, anything? Yeah, sorry, Phil. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah, and 
and the hardness of heart thing is so important because again, like, let's use a different analogy of like slavery, okay? Slavery is regulated in the law of Moses. Does that mean it's, it's celebrated? Of course not. Um, so the idea of hardness of heart is God knows that we're depraved sinners. And because of that, he knows that we're going to live in a broken world where bad things happen. And guess what's worse uh, than a world where bad things happen? It's a world where bad things happen and there's no laws to govern the, those bad things. And so that's part of it. Yeah, um, you know, the, the separation of the wives, it, it honestly is, is to me one of the most gut-wrenching moments but it, 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 in, in, in the Old Testament, because it's like, you've got wives, you've got kids, and they have to leave them behind. But the reason was, is that, that the purpose was, hey, you've got you've to follow God with all of your heart. And if, if you are aligning yourselves with families that are built upon the premise of um, not assimilating to the God of Israel, then that, that won't work. Now, it's, it's possible, and this is, this is always something worth remembering. Um, there are so many exceptions, for instance, Ruth, where it's like it's not about marrying a foreign woman. It's about the idea that that marriage will lead you astray if, for instance, if instead of Boaz marrying Ruth, what if he was like Solomon who married the daughter of Pharaoh or like Ahab who married the daughter of Jezebel who had no intention of changing? In other words, is it possible that an exception that was understood was that if the wives were willing to assimilate into Israel's faith, then of course they could stay just like Ruth did. Well, yeah, that's possible. Um, but the point is, if you're not willing to, to say what Ruth did, your people will be my people and your God will be my God, well, then you can't be married to someone who's part of the people of God. It just wasn't, it wasn't acceptable. So... Um, and, and this, well, we're not, I won't get into that, but good question, good question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's because it was a total identity to them. You know, it, it, and, and that's part of what the law sought to do. It's not just you go to synagogue on Sabbath. It's every day you have to avoid that which is unclean, right? So it, it really was an all or nothing kind of passing it on. Um, and uh, now, of course, there are, there are downfalls with that too. You could, you could do outward conformity to the law, but your heart could be far from God. But at least in terms of the externals, it really was, you either did it or you didn't. Um, and there was no in-between. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we do have that problem in terms of passing on the faith. Part of, part of it is, at least my opinion on this, um, is that we, we really do uh, have an, an, an assimilation problem. I mean, where we see assimilation with the culture as uh, not, and uh, honestly, at some point, it's not just that it's normal, it's that it's desirable. Like, you don't, you don't want to be too radical about your faith, otherwise you'd be weird. Okay, well, kingdom of priests. Like, what do you, I mean, what do we say? Except Paul says, and this is why Paul uses the same language, and we're out of time, but it's like, uh, Paul uses the same language of be salt, be light, be different, and that's good. Um, Anyway, all right, yeah, we're out of time. So I'd love to talk more, uh, really good issues. And, uh, and these are the kind of things, the questions that are good to bring up and it's what the text brings up. So thank you for your questions and uh, we'll head it again next week. Thanks.